We are often reminded that too much of a good thing is bad for you. Antibiotics certainly fall into that category. Antibiotic miracles and antibiotic resistance. Tonight, on call with the Prairie Doc. Good evening, and welcome to On Call with the Prairie Doc. This is the third of four programs that we're recording in Rapid City in the wonderful new facilities of South Dakota Public Broadcasting. The great promise of antibiotics was an end to terrible diseases that took the lives of millions, but then the bug started to develop resistance to our best weapons due in large part to the way we use them. That took that effectiveness away. First, let's take a look at this week's Prairie Doc quiz question. <clears throat> it is a true or false question. True or false, antibiotics usually help in relieving sinus pain. True or false. We'll have the answer later on in the program. Joining us tonight is Dr. James Michael Keegan of Regional Health Physicians here in Rapid City. Uh, thank you for joining us, Mike. Thank you. But now, are you still with regional uh, physicians? No, actually, I'm independent with the independent corporation that we work uh, throughout the country. So you're working throughout the country with what purpose in mind? To help other hospitals and physicians uh, use antibiotics in a way that preserves them for uh, future patients in a safe manner. Wow, so your, your purpose is to spread this word throughout the United States. Now, I know you had a great effort in the two, early 2000s. Uh, you came to Brookings and gave a talk about overuse of antibiotics, and it changed a lot of what we do in, and did in Brookings at the time. How good did this effort that you have made uh, work in South Dakota? Well, what's to provide context, what's happening in much of the rest of the country is antibiotics are losing effectiveness, as you've mentioned. And that's due to the overuse of antibiotics and the overuse of certain types of antibiotics. So in the early 2000s, what we noticed was that the older antibiotics were just as effective and not causing those types of problems. So things like penicillin, when you prove that there's an infection that needs treatment, uh, are very effective. And, and don't tend to drive the bacteria to create resistance, much like some of the newer antibiotics do. Like Levaquin and what other? Well, we label them broad spectrum antibiotics, meaning that they kill a lot of different types of bacteria. And the strategy was if we use those, then we don't need to really uh, identify what we're dealing with because we're covering all the bases. Well, what that strategy has led to is damaging our own protective bacteria and leading to bacterial resistance in infections where there's no uh, antibiotic effectiveness anymore. I remember you telling this story when in like 2000 in Brookings in our conference room that you had said to the, the people treating uh, urinary tract infections particularly uh, that you couldn't use Levaquin or you, you couldn't use Cipro uh, for a urinary tract infection unless an infectious disease person was consulted. And so they had to use the old antibiotics. And what happened at that time? What we did, we uh, talked with all our medical staff and all our providers, our nurse practitioners, and PAs and pharmacists and so forth back in the early 2000s and just laid out the scientific case in the literature and said that if questions came up as to what antibiotic to use, just contact me and we could talk through it based on what the sensitivities were of the bacteria of our region. The huge advantage that we have in a rural area is we have one microbiology lab that tells us when we use different antibiotics what happens in our region. So we were seeing increasing resistance, much like the rest of the country, but we made the changes and started showing a decreased resistance. So our goal in 2000 was to keep our antibiotics just as effective for us in 2010, and we hit that goal. Now the goal is can we keep our antibiotics just as effective in 2020 as they were in 2000, and we're on track to do that as well. Right. So I remember you saying that the, the two big bugs that were bad are the MRSA, you know, the, it's commonly called, what is it called? It's called the mega bug or, or whatever. Super bug. Super bug. Mm -hmm the methicillin-resistant uh, staph aureus, and uh, Enterobacter? 
Enterobacter, Pseudomonas, and then also Clostridium difficile has become that, the number one infectious complication in the country. Right, that diarrhea that comes after an antibiotic. Exactly, and after because certain types of antibiotics mainly. All yes. right. So what happened when you made those uh, those changes in, in Rapid City initially? Well, our uh, rate of MRSA, the resistant staff, was about national average. About uh, like 20 percent, 30 percent? Well, back then it would have been about uh, 50 percent. And so that came down to 35 percent, and it was the first time uh, in the country that had been reported you could actually lower that with the way you used antibiotics. Right. And so what it is now is 31 percent, which is about half the national average. And the reason that's important is if you have a resistant staph infection, MRSA, in the blood as opposed to a sensitive staph, same bacteria but just a different pattern of antibiotics that you can use, you have half the mortality risk. Half the half, death rate. Half the death rate of a sensitive staph. So if you can steward the bacteria back to being more sensitive by the way you use antibiotics, then you're saving lives. Wow. And uh, the same thing happened, I think you, you said the enterobacter went from like 30 percent to zero. Yeah, the, uh, we had two other uh, bacteria that were very impressive. One was the actually the enterococcus, enterococcus. Uh, that w had become resistant to vancomycin, and that had been 20, 30 percent. You have a very good memory, and dropped to zero. <laughs> I've repeated the story so many times again. <laughs> and then the Clostridium difficile uh, across the country has created a very dangerous situation, where uh, 10 percent of people over 65 actually die from that infection. We don't have that strain uh, in much of South Dakota because we've used antibiotics in a way that doesn't promote that. So uh, you've done really well in Rapid City, but what about the state of South Dakota? I mean, you know, you, do you think it's because of your effort? I, I think it is. Well, uh, we've been accused that the magical properties of the Missouri River ha had some benefit, <laughs> but, but we actually have worked with a couple of smaller <clears throat> communities, and we really enjoy working with the rural hospitals because they are so effective at getting things done. There's a lot less bureaucracy and, mm -hmm. and so forth. And, and uh, we've worked with a couple smaller hospitals in the eastern side of the state and able to replicate the Rapid City model in those hospitals. And they've dramatically decreased their antibiotic use and their amount of resistant bacteria as well. So, uh, and that's, uh, I think, a powerful statement in that it's the model and not the geography. It's, it's not the Missouri River, <laughs> it, is, it is the model. Well, you've, in your corporation of trying to spread this important stewardship thing, you've gone to other states and other places in the U.S. Tell us about that. Yes, we've done a lot of work in West Virginia. And the West Virginians, I spent four years there in practice. It's just a wonderful people and uh, just been a blessing to be able to, to, work, with to work with them. And, and we put together a project statewide with the West Virginia Hospital Association, working with 30 hospitals, all the major hospitals and uh, about 15 critical access hospitals and several other medium-sized hospitals. And they dramatically decreased the amount of broad-spectrum antibiotics. They decreased the number one use broad-spectrum antibiotics, 37 percent, which is absolutely incredible. Levaquin. Levaquin in that case, yes. And, and once again, it, uh, I categorize them as broad spectrum because there's about six others that fit that category as well, and we focused on all those, including the, the levoquin. And, um, and these are good antibiotics, but if they're used initially or primarily, they lose effectiveness and create resistance. If they're used as a backup, last-ditch type of situation, they remain effective. And so the state of West Virginia did incredible work and their critical access hospitals uh, during that project year led the country in uh, antibiotic stewardship. I, I, you, we were talking early before the show, and I was interested in uh, you, you run into some resistance in the bigger hospitals where the infectious disease leaders are not. I mean, who are you to tell me what to do? All right. Yeah, I think the, uh, uh, my partner and I in our corporation, we've noticed this, and it's been a little embarrassing since I'm an infectious disease specialist. We would say maybe one in five infectious disease specialists actually are leading the charge using the more powerful latest antibiotics, and it's very hard to, to influence their change, whereas 
when we show the results to medium and smaller size hospitals and then they replicate those results, that's a powerful message to the prescribers in those communities. Yeah. I, you know, one of the things that I, I've seen sometimes infectious disease people do is you have a, a urinary tract infection, they culture the, uh, the organism, uh, it's been hit by a million different antibiotics, so now the only thing that it's, you know, works is it's Levaquin or it's Cipro or it's this Carbapenem or it's some very broad spectrum thing, and they go right to it. Yeah. Uh, and I have uh, espoused the, the Mike Keegan philosophy of use the old guys and see how they do. Exactly. Uh, and what, what's more, the, the, the problem with urinary tract infection, particularly in the nursing home, is if you look at it, almost 80% of the women in a nursing home are going to have some kind of bug grown in their bladder. It's sitting there happy, living with the, the, uh, the owner exactly. and, and not causing any trouble. But if somebody, something goes wrong with the patient, they'll, they'll blame the urine They'll culture it, and then they'll give them this broad, broad, powerful antibody. It's a mistake. It is, it, and, and it's an evolution in our understanding of, the, of best practice, and that what we have learned is that uh, now with the molecular, genet molecular diagnostics that are just very powerful, that there's actually normal bacteria in the, in the bladder that we never knew before. And those normal bacteria probably help protect us from having urinary infections. So if we culture them, and we try to get rid of them, we're actually causing damage. Right. So when you have a bacteria, which is what you're referring to, bacteria in the urine with no symptoms, or even with some vague symptoms, that's not an indication for treatment. And so you have to evaluate that and protect the patient from an exposure to antibiotics that can be harm, uh, very harmful and damaging and provide no benefit in that case. Let's talk about the microbiome or the microbiota as they I, mean, I think it's more correctly. Correct. But everybody knows it as the microbiome. Uh, they found that all these non-human cells, which we all thought were human for many years, now that we've got the genetics, we've realized we're living in a world of, what, pig pen on Snoopy, and <laughs> whatever that, you know, that we, we are an organism of more bacteria or the same amount of bacteria and virus and fungi or fungi than, than the rest. What's your, your comment about a microbiome? Yeah, the Walt Whitman quote is, we are legions. Uh, it applies to the microbiome. Uh, we have about 40 trillion cells in our body, but we have about 100 trillion bacterial cells in our body. So if you just look at the genes, we have more bacterial genes in our body than we have human genes. And in the past, we'd think all bacteria are bad, uh, but with the microbiome, we understand how essential they are in our health. Well, we'd bleed to death, for example, if, if we didn't they have... They metabolize vitamin K or, or, create, or uh, create vitamin K for us. Uh, if we didn't have bacteria, we couldn't do that one bleed to death, as you mentioned. But they probably influence our immune system. And antibiotic exposure at a very young age increases our risk of having allergies later in life. There is a lot of research going on right now as far as whether antibiotic exposure potentially is associated with autoimmune diseases, uh, is an association with diabetes, is there an association with Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, a variety of entities. Uh, a recent JAMA article talked about the, the association with atherosclerosis. So we're just at the beginning of understanding a lot of this, but it's, but it's just absolutely fascinating what may come of it. So to put, we bring that to a concentrated point, and, and that is it's, it's not good to mess with Mother Nature. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And it might be doing us harm. Exactly. In recent years, we have begun to discover we are not alone in this world. We carry a diverse population of flora and fauna on our journey through life. The microbiome uh, project uh, came into existence because of the Human um, Genome Project that was launched by National Institute of Health in um, early 2000. Um, the idea was to catalog all the um, genes in our genome so that we can develop uh, uh, diagnostics, um, personalized medicine, uh, and various uh, you know treatments based on genomics. So um, antibiotics. Um, 
is um, causes major uh, damage uh, to the microbiome because uh, the action of antibiotics uh, although cures bacterial infections they also they are broad spectrum which means uh, besides the bacteria that cause the disease they can also um, cause a wide uh, variety of related bacteria so in other words it, it is something like you know setting a rainforest on fire um, you might be able to you know um, flesh out um, some uh, bad players there but then you're you know sort of you know wiping out the whole area um, there is a lot of studies showing that uh, use of probiotics can help uh, you know um, reverse um, redu uh, reduce the severity of uh, diarrhea and diseases like that but at the same time there are like uh, an another set of studies um, saying that probiotics pretty much don't do anything or oftentimes you know uh, reverse increases the time of recovery after antibiotic uh, treatment so the fecal transplantation um, is a poster case for the efficacy of uh, uh, the power of uh, micro what microbes can do to our health um, so it was discovered first um, in the mainstream medicine as a treatment against uh, clostridium difficile infection um, the primary trigger for clostridium difficile infection is the use of antibiotics and what happens there is uh, when the and when C. difficile causes infection which is a secondary infection now um, doctors, doctors typically prescribe uh, another antibiotic so with each round of antibiotic uh, recurrence uh, more antibiotic is given which causes more depletion of uh, microbiome in the gut which means the patient's microbiome over time is uh, sort of depleted completely and it causes mortality. Overall goal in the future for the research community right now, what we are trying is to come up with a defined blend of beneficial bacteria that can uh, you know, cure diseases like C. difficile instead of using the whole fe fecal material. That's really interesting. My comment to you would be, um, obviously, this has changed infectious disease uh, tremendously. What would you say in summary about microbiomes or biota that we live with? Well, I absolutely agree. It's turned my world upside down in that uh, we have to understand it's, a, it's essentially an organ that we have to protect, much like the kidneys or uh, the liver, for instance and not understand what we're doing and, and not cause harm because it's so essential to a number of uh, uh, vital uh, health issues for us. And, and so when we're talking about stewardship, it's not so much antibiotic stewardship, it's microbial stewardship, including our own uh, protective bacteria. Or that organ. That, that organ. Organ of the microbiome. I hadn't thought of it as that. So <clears throat> my wife's a pediatric nurse practitioner. I think about pediatrics as the area that people just, you know, it's just a lot of antibiotics. They come in, there's an ear infection, they have a sore throat, you do a strep culture, it has, it's positive for strep. Uh, and, and the standard is to use antibiotics in those scenarios, particularly, you know, resistant ear infections and so on. What's your, what's your recommendation to a pediatrician or a family physician who's doing all that pediatric? Well, historically, our approach was to not take any chances and use antibiotics because we didn't know that there was a downside to the right. antibiotic use. But now what we know with better uh, diagnostic testing is 90, 95, maybe as much as 98% of outpatient respiratory infections, including ear infections and sinus infections, are viral, in which antibiotics are not indicated. So at that point, you're only damaging the microbiome and you're not providing any benefit to recover from that particular infection. Right, antibiotics don't help with viruses. Exactly, yeah. Now, now we have some antiviral pills uh, that we use for influenza, for example. How effective are they? They're generally effective if taken early on. And, and for, a, for a flu, for, for an influenza. For, for influenza. But for the rest of the uh, respiratory viral infections, there's really not anything effective at this point. But there is active research uh, going into that. 
And so maybe in the future we'll have some uh, better medicines there. But I think the key is understanding the risk-benefit ratio of what your decision is. And there we have newer diagnostics that can tell you if it's a viral infection or bacterial infection. And that's where we really need to invest our efforts in getting the diagnosis correct. Right. And if it's a viral infection, you're adding value to that patient by giving them the answer to what the problem is, what to expect from it, how to protect other family members. And then if something happens that would suggest a bacterial superinfection, you educate to that effect, and then you uh, tell them to notify you of that, then you re reevaluate. So it's the watch and wait approach yeah. uh, that's been very uh, successful. I know that in Europe, uh, a lot of ear infections are just left alone. Right. But you know, when it's red and it looks pussy and it's draining, does that automatically mean bacteria? Well, what we've done uh, is we have taken worst case scenario and make that our general approach to every ear infection uh, historically, not so much lately, but historically. And, and I see that in most every infection presentation that there is, is we tend to generalize from the worst case scenario because we think that's the safest thing. But what, we're, what we now know is that's a very damaging approach and puts us at risk of potentially fatal other infections. So the, the proper approach is to get the diagnosis, and once you know the diagnosis, to not, uh, if it's viral, to not expose that person to antibiotics. And what, what diagnostic tool, I mean, white count? Well, no, the, there's specific uh, molecular diagnostic testing for as much as 25 viral uh, pathogens in the respiratory uh, track uh, uh, available to the outpatient. We're going to do a project here in Rapid City making that very extensively available and see how much we can decrease outpatient antibiotic use. Well, that would be a, a great thing. How about strep throat? I mean, you know, I culture uh, really red sores, mean looking throats, and you find a percentage of people who have it. I, I do know there's some data to say that if you just cultured 100 people off the street, percentage of those people are also going to have strep throat. Should we use antibiotics in those cases? Well, uh, we always have to keep in mind that in treating strep throat, what we're also attempting to do is preventing rheumatic fever and preventing kidney uh, complications. And so if, it, if we feel it's a legitimate strep throat, then it should be treated with penicillin uh, or an alternative antibiotic. Uh, however, uh, so many of these thing, uh, infections are viral, and a person can be colonized with streptococcus, and that's a, that's a difficult distinction to make. So once again, doing the viral diagnostic test may add some uh, additional information to help make a, a decision. Right. Well, so our hope is in viral diagnostic testing that, that's to come. It, it is, and the technology is moving very quickly. We. Uh, uh, are familiar with several companies that are moving this. Right now the cost is a little bit of an issue, but as there's more competition that cost comes down, uh, I think that's going to be as commonly done as a strep screen, for instance. All right. Uh, my thought uh, about uh, the use of antibiotics is that it's the, the biggest uh, use in humans really is this pediatric population. But there's also antibiotics used in the animal world, uh, and I know uh, some people would say, oh, the, this three or four times the amount of antibiotics used in humans is used in, 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 uh, in uh, cattle and horses and so on and so forth. And the defense that I hear from the vets is, well, one of the antibiotics that we use, the big one, is not ever used in, in humans, and that that's not a problem for us and should be uh, not worried about. You, you understand what I'm talking about? I do. And, and to, once again, uh, to take a step back, the, uh, some of the statistics that have been quoted are uh, of all the antibiotics used in this country, 80% are used in agriculture. Right. And, uh, and in humans, 70% or so are used in outpatient areas, which you're referring to the pediatrics, of which it's estimated 75% of those are not necessary. So there's a huge opportunity. But in animals, if, it's, if the antibiotics are used for growth promotion, there's an excellent uh, example in Denmark where they quit using antibiotics. Uh, it did not uh, significantly affect the growth promotion, and it did not at all affect the financial stability of that industry. 
So there's good examples of getting rid of antibiotic exposure. I, I think that you have to be careful saying that, well, this antibiotic isn't a risk because we don't use it in humans when you're damaging bacteria and they're going to respond in a certain way of creating additional uh, resistant genes that may cross over into some other areas uh, of, the, of the antibiotics that we use for people. Right. Well, and you know, I know that if you use a particular antibiotic that uh, affects this bug, that bug will teach other bugs related to them and unrelated that, that, that you can have resistance, that that resistance spreads. Exactly. And um, the one way of thinking about that is the bacteria are very promiscuous oh, yeah. and they <laughs> share their genes very freely. We used to think it was just one type of bacteria would share genes with one type of bacteria, but they with a lot of different bacteria. So what we've come to learn is not only do we live in a sea of bacteria as humans, but we live in a sea of resistant genes as well. There's resistant genes in the smog in China, for instance, that's been detected and resistant genes and pathogenic genes in the water of the eastern part of the state that we understand, but in the pristine trout streams of western South Dakota as well. And so we're constantly exposed to these things, and what's protecting us from it is our own normal bacteria. So why would we take an antibiotic to, to damage our own protective bacteria from all this resistant genes and pathogenic genes out there? I like to, to use the example of uh, killing the grass on my lawn and then if you leave it alone, will the grass come back quickly or what happens? Well, the weeds come rolling in. It's the weeds that come in. The, the resistant weeds. And so, uh, you know, your, back, your, your own grass is your best protectant against weeds. Exactly. I think that's a, a wonderful analogy. The, the, uh, the other component of that is if you are exposed to an antibiotic, there's a good study out of the Centers for Disease Control, it takes up to maybe a year to re restore your normal bacteria, your normal grass, if you will. If you're repeatedly exposed, your normal bacteria may not ever return to normal. So we, we have to be cognizant of what, we're, what damage we're potentially doing to a, an essential organ for us. New antibiotic, new, different antibiotic, different antibiotic. You're wiping out your normal flora and it's getting more and more destroyed. I was encouraged, though, by the, uh, you, the uh, study that I'd heard from, I think it was Denmark, but it could have been one of those Scandinavian countries where they said, all right, we're, we, we are, we're clamping down. We're regulatory, okay? You don't have the freedom to do everything you want. This is what we're going to do. And they stopped a lot of antibiotic use. And they found that resistance went away, that, that the sensitivity to antibiotics came back. That yeah. was encouraging to me. Very encouraging. And the Netherlands had a very nice example where they just use ampicillin for people coming in the hospital with, uh, with pneumonia, and, and, which is a narrow spectrum, relatively narrow spectrum antibiotic compared to all the others uh, available. And their MRSA rate is down in single digits, which is leading the world right now. This is in the Netherlands? In the Netherlands, yes. And you would say that that is, that is directly uh, a correlation of the reduction in the antibiotics? Absolutely. And that's the, that's the example that we look at in western South Dakota to try to replicate. And so we're trying to content, uh, consistently reverse engineer our antibiotic use to keep our bacteria sensitive and, and make them more sensitive if we can. Yeah, it, it, part of the thinking is it doesn't add advantage to a bacteria survival compared to a sensitive bacteria because it requires more energy to have that resistance genes or that pathogenic genes. Right. So if we can prevent the stimulus from occurring to create resistance from a bacterial survival standpoint and our own sensitive bacteria have a survival advantage, then it makes some sense to help them in that uh, in competition. That, yes. Antibiotic resistance is not a regional problem or a problem for certain countries. It is a worldwide concern. You know, just a brief history, uh, we know, you know, the antibiotics have helped cure a lot of infections uh, and they have decreased mortality, you know, and illness from infectious diseases since 1940 when the antibiotics have been used and Alexander Fleming, you know, got penicillin in 1928, you know, or so. Uh, but over the last uh, uh, 
I would say last 10 to 20 years, we have seen a significant uh, and inappropriate use of antibiotics. And what that has done, uh, it has led to the emergence of many resistant anti, uh, uh, microorganisms, which are uh, resistant to many classes of the antibiotics. So we are now faced uh, with a situation where some of the bugs are resistant to almost every antibiotic. So you can call them XDR or extremely drug resistant organisms. And there are no antibiotics to treat them local or a national problem, it's a worldwide problem. So apart from the bacterial infections, you know, in the third world we have TB, which is extremely drug resistance, and we have malaria, which is drug resistance. We are just recognizing this in USA more when we are faced with the uh, gram-negative infections resistance. Yeah. I think there are three sort of major points that we have to always keep in mind. There's the bugs, as Dr. Nazir has said, there's the drugs for which we have a uh, plummeting uh, uh, resource because the drug companies are not investing in new antibiotics. I mean, f I mean, think about it. Uh, for, uh, what do you think a pharmaceutical company is going to invest in? A statin that's used for 20 years or an antibiotic that's used for 10 days? Do the math. And you can, you can see why, since I came to Sioux Falls in 1986, where between a, about a four-year period of time, there were 16 new d different antibiotics between 86 and 90. Since that time and over the last four years, I, I believe we've had two new, new antibiotics, antibiotics that have come. So you can see where this is, and, and you, you just do the math. Um, and the third. So the third thing is the bugs, the drugs, and then it's us. Um, uh, Dr. Talley, who's uh, Dean Emeritus, famously said in a meeting that I happened to be at, he said, you know, the physician is primarily a social scientist. Now, the public kind of thinks we're scientists. In reality, we're, we're really more like social scientists. And that simply means that um, we try to bring science into a social context. Because it's never just the bug and the drug, it's always the child who is having spiking a fever at 103 degrees, and their parent is deathly afraid that, that the child is going to die. And, and so uh, there are pressures on both sides. And so there's both the provider element, and then there's the the patient element. I think South Dakota has outstanding health care. Uh, the quality is very good. The three systems are excellent. And I think people uh, are very well served in South Dakota, Nebraska, Minnesota. Best quality in the, in the, country, in the country is in the upper, upper Midwest in our region, including Wisconsin and so forth. So we're talking in relative terms here. But I think the when we first had antibiotics, as you mentioned at the very beginning, they were life-saving. We, we had nothing before that other than very draconian measures that often weren't effective. Then as we got more and more antibiotics, we felt that we well, just use something that will kill everything, just to be extra careful. And now what we're seeing is the consequences of things, the overreach of antibiotics. And so we, the reason that we term this antibiotic stewardship is it's very similar to, um, I have a small ranch in western South Dakota. I steward the, the trees on my ranch. I take care of them. I try to make sure that I do the right thing for them. I don't over uh, prune, uh, them. prune them, or, and, and I, but I do, uh, I'm very careful with them. So antibiotics are a very precious resource, as Dr. Hoffman mentioned, that there are not more of them now. And so our goal is to try to make sure the antibiotics we have are effective for us 10 years from now or 20, or 20 years from now if, if we still need them. So it, it's, it's a strategy uh, that the CDC and the health department uh, is ask, going to ask us to do as three, as physician leaders and as health systems, to how do we cut back on the total antibiotics used? How do we cut back on the types of antibiotics used? so that we have this precious resource for years to come. And as a primary care guy, I mean, you guys aren't, but I am, and I'm on the front line, and I can tell you I feel the pressure from the patient that says, and you mean to tell me I came here, had that time in the waiting room, I'm spending the time to get it, I want to walk out of here with nothing, I'll go, I can tell you I'm not going to be back to you, I'm going to go to the guy who's going to give me an antibiotic. Well, I, think that's, comment to well that? I think that's why we need to work together. I mean, Lord knows the bacteria are working together against us. They are, aren't they? And, you know, I don't know any bacteria that, that uh, prefers Sanford versus Avera or is going to get on a, <laughs> actually, they'll get on a car and go out to Rapid City as well. Yeah. So um, the point being that if we don't work together, then here's the social science part. If we don't work together, our patients are going to lose. 
And um, because they're, a lot of them, and not that many of us, I mean, think of it, somebody has, has done the calculation, and every one of us, we have about 10 and 13 zeros following the number of cells in our body. We, we contain 10 to 14 zeros of bacteria. So actually, literally, we walk around and the bacteria outnumber our normal cells. So there are a lot of them out there. And there are a lot of those bugs, aren't yes, there? Yes, they are. More and than so, there are cells of us. Yeah, and so the, 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 the approach has to be a cross system. Well, I think about those uh, words of wisdom. I think about the, but it brings me back to the veterinarians and the, uh, the farmers and ranchers who use antibiotics pretty willy-nilly. Uh, do you think that they are moving in the right direction? Well, no, I think the, as we have learned more and more, uh, I think there's the opportunity to not use antibiotics for growth promotion. And we're not talking about treating uh, appropriate infection. treatment infections, but growth promotion in that, uh, I think there's good examples, as we mentioned, uh, in other parts of the world, in Denmark, for instance, where uh, they did just fine. And what happens is you create resistant bacteria that gets in the soil, and those bacteria in the soil leach into our water, for instance, the Big Sioux River or the Skunk Creek or areas like that. And, and even in western South Dakota, where you'd expect that there would be much less exposure, we're seeing resistant and pathogenic genes there. What do is some excellent work by some researchers at the School of Mines. Wow. You know, uh, somebody said that if you take a, one cup of dirt from your garden, there are more organisms in that one cup of dirt than there are people in the, United, in the world. Have you heard that? That ever were, actually. <laughs> it's absolutely incredible. I mean, it's just uh, billions to trillions of, of bacteria. And those types of bacteria, there's excellent books out there that you could read that just talk about how essential that is to the growth of everything and uh, promotes, uh, it protects uh, from disease in other plants, protects from disease in, in animals, in us, in our, with our microbiome. So um, all of this makes me think that um, the development of antibiotics has been a miracle. It's been wonderful that we have them, but uh, there are problems with them. We need to learn, learn about it. Uh, some of the problems I have heard, you know, touted, maybe it's by the pharmaceutical industry, is that we, we're just not developing new antibiotics, and part of the reason is that that's not where the money is. It's a lot of work, and you end up with uh, something that's used for seven to 10 days, and, and instead of, an uh, uh, antihypertensive that people need to take the rest of their lives, for example. Exactly. What's your, what's your comment about antibiotic development? Well, I think that's true. It's not as big a profit margin for uh, uh, a developing pharmaceutical company as would be a, a very expensive biologic agent, for instance, something of that nature. And I don't think the answer to uh, the resistant bacteria challenge is new antibiotics. Yeah, I think it's less antibiotics <laughs> and, and better diagnostics. And I think we're seeing some very exciting uh, moves in the diagnostic area by several companies across the country that just give you an answer within an hour of what's going on. And if you can get an answer and that cost comes down so that it's not prohibitive, uh, then you don't need an antibiotic exposure. And you certainly don't need a broad spectrum antibiotic exposure. You can spe treat specifically for what that bacteria is, and then you protect the protected bacteria of your own intestine and skin that way. So if I did an uh, antibiogram, so I checked the resistance of the organism to, to um, an the antibiotics, uh, it drives me to go to a broader spectrum often. Uh, is, should we be thinking about, um, and this is what I had a tendency to do and I got resistance and I've gotten some, uh, some uh, disagreement. Uh, I, would, I would go to the old antibiotics. I would use uh, Bactrim or I would use Keflex or Cephalexin uh, and I would use Amoxicillin. Mm -hmm. For uh, urinary tract infections, uh, the sensitivity looks like, well, it's going to be resistant to that organism, but I'm using the old ones, and they seem to get better. 
What's your take on that? Yeah, I, th I think that what we're seeing more and more is uh, it, it, if you go to a broad spectrum early on, you knock out other options. So whenever you can go to the narrow spectrum, the older antibiotics, uh, they're almost always effective. And the more you use them, the more sensitive the bacteria become to allow that to occur. We've seen that across the country with, with the antibiograms for multiple hospitals and multiple communities. And so to jump straight to a broad spectrum creates the problem as opposed to solve, solving the problem. And it may help one particular patient, but it damages others. Antibiotics are the one medicine where if you take it, I may be harmed. Yeah, if I take it, you can be hurt. Exactly, and so it's a community, a public health concept uh, to be able to think through this so that as a community, and we've done this in multiple communities, as a community-wide project, can we decrease the amount of total antibiotic exposure and the types of broad-spectrum antibiotic exposures? And when you do that collaboratively, you see dramatic improvement in that community's antibiogram. If you can push this particular thing, you're helping your grandchildren, your grandparents, you know, you're helping the community. Right. Wow. The, the, the number two question that we get when we talk with hospitals and, and physicians across the country was, our patients expect antibiotics, and if we don't give it to them, they'll go down the street and somebody yeah. else will. And our response is that, no, your patients expect value. And so if you can give them a good diagnosis and to, and as to what to expect, and to your point, now, if we don't use antibiotics here, we save them so they're effective for you in the future and your children in the future and your grandchildren in the future. So you're contributing a good decision to, to the welfare of your family uh, going forward. Um, I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about the difference between a virus and a bacteria. I mean, what is a bacteria? What is a virus? And we also have fungi or fungi. Right. I know that infectious disease people are fun guys, <laughs> fun guys, but um, differentiate between those three organisms. Yeah, the, the, uh, it, uh, the amount of cellular material distinguishes them largely, but, it, but it's actually now that we have better molecular diagnostics, it's their DNA or RNA that distinguish one from another. And the viruses are much smaller organisms. Bacteria have cell walls, so they're larger organisms. And the fungi are much more complex even than that. And it requires different types of treatment uh, uh, to be effective at, at, at treating those if they're pathogens. Now, the viruses are very fascinating in the sense that they can infect bacteria. And that's called a bacteriophage. And we have a lot of those normally in our intestine as well. And we're, so we're partly viral genes, we're partly bacterial genes. There's another organism called, called Archaea that uh, probably has provided the structural basis of all multicellular organisms. The, the rocks, it's the bacteria, I mean bacteria is in the rocks. I mean, oh, yeah. it, <laughs> living beings are, we're at a sea of, of uh, living beings in this world of ours. Somebody said the best example of what the human being is, is sort of like a donut. That uh, the outside of the donut is our skin. The GI tract is the hole, <laughs> the inside, uh, and that donut is really where the microbiome lives. And others have said no, the microbiome is within every organ, it's within every uh, cell in, throughout our body, inside and out. It's not just the outer skin and that donut hole. If you look at it genetically, the latter is correct. If you look at it structurally, the former is correct, meaning that a lot of our cells, especially if you've ever had a, a mononucleosis or a cold sore or chicken pox or shingles, those, that viral genes are still part of you. And, yeah. um, and, and if it's chicken pox, it may show up later in life as yeah. shingles. Yeah, it will. Um, you know, if they're, they're talking, you talked about um, uh, the water of South Dakota. Are we pretty good in South Dakota for the water? Are we better than they are on the East Coast where they're using too many antibiotics, for example? Or what's your take on our water? Yeah, I don't know as much about the water of other states, but the School of Mines has done some very nice work with molecular diagnostic testing, looking specifically at pathogenic genes uh, in E. coli uh, and, and then resistance genes in E. coli. 
So our water has very high amount of resistance and pathogenic genes. And I think the governor's even made the statement that we need to look more critically at the safety and health of our water uh, supplies. And I think that's correct. Um, what, what you can take from that, though, is also, uh, I mean, there's Clostridium difficile spores in sandbox and ground beef. There's resistant genes, and I mean, it's just very prevalent. So why, the point I make to physicians and nurses is why aren't you getting infected every day by being around this when your patients are who are on antibiotics? And so the difference is the antibiotic damage to your protective bacteria. And so if we can prevent the, the antibiotic exposure, we can keep patients safe when the antibiotics aren't indicated. Right. Uh, I know that uh, vaccines haven't been said. We, we need to talk about vaccination. Uh, that's a way to stimulate the immune system to help fight infection instead of antibiotics. Are you a fan of vaccines? Absolutely, absolutely. I think vaccines, uh, one of the major breakthroughs, antibiotics are a major breakthrough as well, but we need to be more discriminating in our use. Uh, vaccines, very important. Uh, I think, once again, have to be a little discriminating there in that they're, most of them are extremely effective and indicated. Uh, there are some that are promoted that are very expensive that we need to look at critically as to what's the best way to use them and so forth. And we're still understanding some, some of the, those recommendations. But uh, absolutely key. If you, and, I, and I would say, look at it this way. For instance, West Nile virus. If we had a West Nile virus vaccine, the way West Nile virus works is it's a race once you get bit by that mosquito as to whether that virus gets to your nervous system before your immune system recognizes it and destroys it. If you have a vaccine, your immune system is revved up and ready to go ready to and go. neutralize it right, right there. So I think that's a good example to think of vaccines and how critically important they are because they stimulate your immune system to do what we want them to do. Great. And now for the answer to tonight's Prairie Doc quiz question. It's a true or false question. True or false, antibiotics usually help in relieving sinus pain. True or false, Mike? False. False, <laughs> the answer is false. Most headaches are tension or migraine headaches, although some sinus infections can cause headaches. Allergies with filled and inflamed sinuses are mostly not infectious. One study showed that even when classic symptoms of infection were present, only one in seven of those would be helped with an antibiotic. We'll be right back after this. Welcome to your Prairie Doc Library at www.prairiedoc.org. Wherever you live or travel, you and your family can enjoy free and easy access 24 hours a day. Search for a specific topic, browse through the television shows, radio programs, and blog page. You, your family, and friends around the world can learn from physicians and other health professionals answering questions on a variety of medical topics. Visit your Prairie Doc Library today at www.prairiedoc.org. Be careful when you mess with Mother Nature. Once we began defining the human genome, we started to realize how many bacteria, fungi, and viruses live in and on our bodies. We believed that each person standing in front of us are made up of equal numbers of human cells to the number of non-human cells. These are not mere hitchhikers. They are essential to our living. Even within each human cell, we have components called mitochondria that originally were bacteria. Eons ago, they became incorporated and an essential part of the functioning human cell. We couldn't survive without the outsiders. Simply put, we are like a country made up of natives and immigrants working together for the good of the whole. The attached non-human organisms together make up what has been called the human microbiome or microbiota. Researchers are trying to know better what is a normal or an abnormal microbiome, what causes it to be imbalanced, and what can be done to enhance a healthy microscopic environment of organisms that are getting a lift on our bodies. A powerful example of imbalance comes when the use of antibiotics alters the microbiome and results in the emergence of a harmful and even deadly overgrowth infection by a bacterium called 
Clostridium difficile, or C. diff. The result is a very sick, large intestine. Think how weeds can take over a lawn when the grass is destroyed. Aside from the invasive, severe gut illness of C. diff, there are other human conditions and illnesses that may be related to an imbalance of microbiome, such as irritable bowel syndrome, psoriasis of the skin, uncomfortable infections of the vagina, obesity, and rheumatoid arthritis, as well as neuropsychiatric disorders such as autism, schizophrenia, obsessive compulsive disorder, attention deficit disorder, and chronic fatigue syndrome. Research is ongoing, and we have a lot more to know before we have microbiome-related treatments. But we all know that when used appropriately, antibiotics help people and save lives, but experts estimate that 20 to 50 percent of the use of these microbiome-disturbing antibiotics are inappropriate or unnecessary when used in a hospital setting, and that percentage is worse when used in an outpatient setting. Understanding and protecting our normal flora, our microbiome, the community of organisms that live in, on, and around us, gives us a whole new way of dealing with many illnesses. We need to be very careful to use antibiotics only when absolutely necessary. Be careful when you mess with Mother Nature. So, Mike, any take-home messages that you want to make sure people have? I think one thing in particular is when you talk about viral infections, it, it sounds like it's dismissive. Oh, you just have a virus. Whereas there's things like Ebola virus that are 75% fatal. And so viruses can be just as fatal or more so than bacteria. And so when we put a name on a virus, that's very helpful for people to understand the, the consequences and the risk and so forth. And I think that uh, it also helps a patient understand that you care enough to get a diagnosis for them and, and, and help. Well, I can't tell you how important the Keegan philosophy is, and it, you've changed my way of practice in 2000 when you came to speak to Brookings, and I thank you for that. Well, thank you. A big thank you to our guest, Dr. James Michael Keegan of Regional Health, not of Regional Health, of, of Rapid City. His experience in this subject helps our discussion immensely. And a big thank you as well to the South Dakota public broadcasting crew who have helped with our programs in Rapid City. Their hospitality made our time here feel like home. Well, that does it for tonight. From all of us here at On Call with the Prairie Doc, until next time, stay healthy out there, people. Hello to all. I am Dr. Tom Luzier, a practicing allergist in Aberdeen, South Dakota. Born in Kansas, I embrace the diversity of South Dakota. This diversity comes with a price, limited health care resources and information. The Healing Words Foundation, through Prairie Doc, provides an open, online, interactive, public broadcasting format for reliable health information. As a member of the Healing Words Foundation board, I am asking you, please, to join me in support of this work, which is funded entirely by donations from you. Please consider making a personal or corporate gift to Healing Words Foundation, a 501c3. Go to prairie.org and click on the Donate button and make a valuable contribution. Thank you. Major funding for On Call with the Prairie Doc has been provided by Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call on South Dakota Public Broadcasting. Larson Manufacturing is proud to support On Call Television as it continues to open doors for important medical information. And by the South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, the Medicare Quality Improvement Organization for South Dakota, and with the ongoing support of these individuals and institutions. Brookings Health System, Ophthalmology Limited, 
American Academy of Family Physicians Foundation and South Dakota Academy of Family Physicians, Avera Heart Hospital, Dakota Allergy and Asthma, CoBank, Fishback Financial Corporation, Vance Thompson Vision, Brown Clinic, Aberdeen District Medical Society, 3rd District Medical Society, 7th District Medical Society, Dakota Bank, Orthopedic Institute, Physicians Care Sanford Clinic Community Service Committee, Aberdeen Asthma and Allergy, and Swiftel Communications. Thank mm -hmm. you.